welcome back and today we're working on the vacuum tube computer. Now it's been quite a long time since the last update on this machine. So long in fact that uh, probably a not insubstantial number of uh, viewers are uh, wondering what on earth this is. And if that is you and if you are looking at this going, my God, it's huge. What is that? Uh, all I really have to say is that um, this is only a quarter of it. <laughs> We've got three more pieces this size to build. It's gonna fill out the wall, almost floor to ceiling. Uh, it's gonna be huge and awesome, but that doesn't answer the question of what it is. And what it actually is, is a uh, one-bit homebrew computer built using entirely vacuum tubes. These are all 6AU6 pentodes. Now, I also use a lot of uh, little signal diodes, uh, but that was not an uncommon practice in the 1950s. IBM did that a ton on their vacuum tube computers. The, uh, this portion here that you see here is just the processor. It is very heavily inspired by the Motorola MC14500, which is a little one-bit industrial control unit. Now, uh, the MC14500 doesn't have an arithmetic logic unit. It just has a logic unit. Uh, and so if you want to do arithmetic, if you want to do a uh, full add, that takes 12 instructions on the uh, MC14500. That was frustrating me quite a lot. So I did a complete redesign of the logic unit, stuffed a carry register in there, and uh, added in some addition and subtraction functionality. Uh, and so now I can do a full add in just one instruction, which bumps up the capability of this machine quite a bit, but it is at the end of the day still a one bit machine. It has a one bit data bus, but there is no memory on this part. The memory we have to build completely separately. For this one, we, we actually built this guy right here, which is uh, four bits of vacuum tube memory. The actual memory cell is just one 6AU6 and one VFD. They just create a little SR flip-flop. And well, you can see there's four VFDs, so there's four bits on here. So that's just a, a nibble of memory. Uh, now that memory is going to be just for adding and subtracting and moving data around. The actual program itself is going to be stored on magnetic tape, uh, probably just going to use audio tape, something like the uh, Teak reel-to-reel -reel that I have hiding over there behind the Centurion's printer. But that's all way in the future. What I want to focus on today is the memory. And like I said, we built one of those four bits of memory, but we don't really have a great way of getting the data from the data bus here into that memory. And that's what I want to work on today. We have a six bit memory address. And in a previous episode, we built up an inverter and a buffer system for that. And uh, well, we need to finally build the last tiny little bit of address and control so we can pick which bit we want to store our memory in. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, what we have right here is uh, one bit of memory. These are the four 6AU6s that are necessary to build the D flip-flop and uh, the 16977. There are several inputs coming into this that control whether it stores a bit or not. We have a write signal and an inverse write signal that controls whether we're storing or whether we're reading. Uh, we have an X select, a Y select, and a data in. Now the way I've arranged the memory is essentially an eight by eight grid. So I have three bits for X select and three bits for Y select. There is one X select line that feeds eight bits and that X select line is coming from an OR gate that is connected up to the appropriate uh, address lines. But depending on which address lines or inverted address lines that OR gate is connected up to, we're either passing a high signal or a low signal to an entire X select line. And I do the exact same thing for the Y select lines, which means that we still need to build some boards that have three input OR gates connected up to the uh, six buffered or inverted and buffered address lines. So I have a design that I'm pretty happy with. It looks like a nightmare because there's a ton of jumpers, 
uh, but visually I'm able to follow each signal around very clearly on this board. So we'll spin up the mill and start cutting out some boards, but I'm not going to cut out just these addressing boards that are going to sit on the far left. I'm also going to cut out a soft start. And uh, once we have the boards all cut up, it's time to get to soldering. Uh, now, I have a bad track record with soft starts, so I'm probably going to redesign and rebuild this soft start probably 10 more times. But once it's all soldered up and looking good, it's time to start plugging things into each other. And so this required printing out uh, essentially the PCB design for the entire memory uh, board, aligning it, taping it up correctly, and then laying it down on the wooden backboard so I could go through and drill all of the holes that will hold the little standoffs. And then when I put these standoffs in, the boards will sit on them and I can screw them in and hold them firmly in place. Now getting the boards in place was actually a bit fiddly. I had to fight it quite a lot because the PCBs are cut 100% perfect, but I cannot drill 100% perfect. But ultimately, I think we got it. So it's time to start connecting up power to it. All right, so it looks absolutely fantastic on the backboard here. Uh, now you notice that I've got a lot of jumper wires set up. This is just for power distribution. Ultimately, along the right side here are gonna be some really heavy duty power distribution rails but I don't have those yet. So I've got some uh, alligator clips here hooked up to the 24 volts on these two. So hopefully that'll give us a little bit better power distribution. Uh, assuming that the power even actually ever makes it over here. The uh, soft start up here is totally untested. There's only one way to find out and that is to flip the power switch and uh, see what happens. So here goes nothing. Yeah, it jumped up to about uh, 11 amps there, it seems. Uh, I'm showing about 19 volts here. The soft start relay hasn't kicked off yet. I don't know if it's going to. It feels like it should have kicked off by now, and it hasn't. Uh, so <laughs> that's unfortunate. Uh, but we have a, a toggle switch on the soft start relay here, so I can actually manually click it over. Let's do that. Oh, I got something hooked up way wrong. It's actually clicked off. I've got to hold it over. But if I hold it over, I get uh, a proper 22.8 volts here. That's actually pretty good. So I've got a, uh, a problem in my soft, soft start here. It's, uh, maybe I've got it wired up backwards to where it's perpetually turning it off instead of turning it on. <laughs> That's unfortunate. All right, nothing went up in smoke, so let's try to connect this up to the main processor. And uh, that's what I actually have going on with all of these alligator clips going on here. And uh, well, I'm gonna go ahead and flip the processor on with the main supply back here. Uh, it's going to warm up and kick off the uh, soft start all the way at the top. I'll flip on the power supply for the memory here. Soft start is bypassed. I bypassed it by just removing one of the 2D21s. So the processor looks like it's warming up and uh, yeah, this all looks like it's warming up as well. Unfortunately, all of the VFDs are facing down. I, I had initially intended for this to be mounted a little differently, but uh, now we need to initialize the processor because uh, even if I tell it to store something in the memory, it's not gonna happen if OEN is off. So uh, we need to go 1010, we'll use an, uh, the data bus force to one. Yeah, we'll put that in, that put uh, IEN to one. Let's put OEN to one. Um, yeah, I can see it did that. So we'll go ahead and get a one into our result register with zero, one, zero, zero. And then we'll load a zero into our result register with zero, 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 one. The processor is now initialized. So uh, let's try to store a bit from the processor into X zero Y zero. And uh, I can see that the VFD for that bit looks like it's on, uh, which means that that bit is storing a, uh, a zero. So we wanna do a one zero zero one. This will store the inverse of the result register. So the result register is zero. And so that's gonna put the inverse of that on the data bus, which is one. And then it's gonna try and store that one into X zero, Y zero down here. So I'll go ahead and hit the clock. And uh, <laughs> yeah, 
this VFD kicked off. And so now if I do a, a one zero zero zero, this is going to store the result register, which is a zero. And yeah, <laughs> yes. So we, we've managed to store one bit into our actual memory board down here. Uh, now I want to put another address in, just a different address. So I'm gonna go grab a jumper and I'll just jumper one of the random bits to 24 volts. All right, the address now is 001000, which is gonna be um, X1Y0, which is gonna be this VFD right here. And uh, yeah, it seems to be working. It's extremely dim, but I can actually, I can see it flipping state. Um, so whether it's dim or bright shouldn't be too much of an issue because uh, the output of the SR flip-flop is amplified by this NOR gate right here. Um, now there is a different problem. If I connect another jumper up here to make it 001100, that's gonna be this VFD down here. And I can see that that VFD is on, uh, but I, I can't turn it off. And actually, I don't think any of the uh, Y4, 5, 6, or 7 lines are working at all. Uh, I'm gonna have to do a bit more troubleshooting here. All right, it's been a day and change. Uh, I did some more troubleshooting off camera. The top row had all four bits working. The second row was completely dead. Not a single bit worked at all. The third row looked like everything was working except for bit four over here. It was not working. Uh, and then the fourth and bottom row down here uh, was the opposite. It had three dead bits and one bit that was working. Uh, so I pulled these three rows off, took them inside onto the bench, and we had some interesting problems. Uh, we had a couple of bad tubes. Notably, uh, this one right here has an open filament. Some of the other tubes were just not balanced very well with the 6977. Um, because I'm using 6AU6s at 24 volts, and I'm trying to build a flip-flop with a 6AU6 and a VFD, the balance there is really finicky. And I had about three or four bits that were not matched. Uh, the reason that the second row here was totally dead was I actually had a, uh, a bad solder joint that had broken the uh, entire 24 volt line, so it wasn't getting any power at all. And going through and inspecting the rest of these, I had about five bad solder joints, six bad solder joints in total. Well, given that there's multiple thousands of solder joints on these three boards, to only have five or six is pretty good. I'll take that. <laughs> uh, so all three of these are working on the bench now. So I've uh, bolted them back onto our backboard here, plugged everything in, and uh, let's put some addresses in it and see if we can get it working. I've got the lights off to make it a little easier to see the VFDs here. And I'm thinking that we're just gonna go straight down the line here. Uh, so we're gonna do X0, Y0, X0, Y1, uh, X1, Y0, X1, Y1. Uh, so it looks like they're all illuminated, which means that uh, all four of these bits are storing a zero. Uh, so let's put a one into here, which should turn the VFD off. So right now I've got the address to uh, zero, 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 zero. Uh, so we'll just try to store a one in there and yeah, the VFD kicked off. That's good news. It means that the uh, first row is still working here. I haven't actually broken anything. So let's uh, throw on an extra address here. The address is now 0100, which should be this bit here. We'll try to store a one in it. And yeah, the VFD kicked off for it. Uh, so we'll change the address again to uh, 1000, which should put us on this bit right down here. We'll try to put a 1 in there. Yeah, the VFD kicked off on that one. That's excellent news. And then finally, we'll go for an address of 1100. Should be this little VFD on the bottom here. Might be a little difficult to see. And it kicked off. Now, that VFD kicked back on, uh, which was... Uh, uh, one zero zero zero. So if I unplug that, let's let's get a zero back into that. Now I think maybe it kicked back on when I changed the address. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, so changing the address is affecting this flip flop. 
Well, there you have it. Uh, we still have a little bit of troubleshooting to do. The uh, address changing, causing a bit to flip is really strange. I'm gonna need to go through and check that on every single uh, bit, but that's gonna be tough to do with all of these jumpers running around and you know maybe bad jumpers is what's causing the problem in the first place so i think the next step is to uh, build a new harness that properly connects the uh, processor to the memory down here as well as start work on a new remote control that has a 6-bit address with toggle switches. So let's eliminate all of the jankiness, go through and then test all of the bits again, find out what's flipping, and that should make troubleshooting a little easier. Uh, but for now, we have two working bytes of memory for our vacuum tube processor. We are making good progress on it, and now that we have a proper space for it, we're gonna keep making good progress. So I wanna thank you guys so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next episode.